All righty. Okay, guys. Genesis chapter 41, starting in verse 1, we're in the parasha Miketz. Miketz means at the end. Okay, at the end. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, begin by uh, reading uh, a portion of this. So we're going to read 41, 1 through 16. I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible. It says, at the end of two years, Joseph had a dream. He was standing beside the Nile River, and there came out of the river seven cows, sleek and fat, and they began feeding in swamp grass. After them, there came up out of the river seven more cow cows, miserable looking and lean, and they stood by the other cows at the edge of the river. Then the miserable looking and lean cows ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. At this point, Pharaoh woke up. But when he went to sleep again and dreamt a second time, seven full ripe ears of grain grew out of a single stalk. After them, seven ears thin and blasted by east wind sprang up. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven full ripe ears. Then Pharaoh woke up and realized it had been a dream. In the morning, he found himself so upset that he summoned all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them, his dreams, but no one there could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to the pharaoh, today reminds me of something wherein I am at fault. Pharaoh was angry with his officials and put me in prison, in the prison of the house of the captain of the guard, me and the chief baker. One night both I and he had dreams and each man's dreams had its own meaning. Uh, there was with us a young man, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us. He interpreted each man's dream individually, and it came about as he interpreted to us. I was restored to my office, and he was hanged. Then Pharaoh summoned Yosef, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. Now listen, now listen to this, because this really describes his condition. He shaved himself, changed his clothes, and came to Pharaoh. I mean, he's not down. This isn't a modern-day prison where he's lifting weights and watching color TV. <laughs> he's in a dungeon here. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said that you, about you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it isn't for in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer that will set his mind at peace. Then let's go down to verse four, uh, verse 45 and 46 in chapter 45 and 46. Pharaoh called Yosef by the name Zafnat Panecha and gave him as his wife Aznat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. When Joseph went out through then Joseph went out through all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Then he left Pharaoh's presence and traveled through all the land of Egypt. Now drop down to verse 50 and 52. Two sons were born to Joseph before the year of famine came. Aznat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the firstborn Manasseh, causing to forget. Because because God has caused me to forget all the troubles that I suffered at the hands of my family. The second he called Ephraim, which is fruit, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortune. Then let's go over to chapter 42. We're going to look at verse 21. They said to each other, these are the brothers, we are in fact guilty concerning our brother. He was in darkness and pleaded with us. We saw it and wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come upon us now. And then let's go over to chapter 44, 9 and 10. It says, whichever one of us the goblet is found with, let him be put to death and the rest of us will be my Lord's slaves. He replied, fine, let it be as you've said. Whichever one is found uh, with will be my slave, but the rest of you will be blameless. All right. 
So, Father, we thank you for your word, for your Torah. We pray that you would write it on the tablets of our hearts now. And we thank you and praise you, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. All right. Before we get into Roman numeral number two, let me preface it by talking about the Didache. The Didache is uh, the writing. This is a this is a copy of the Didache. Okay, this one happens to be with Messianic commentary, and you can pick these up without commentary for about five bucks. Uh, on Amazon, this one here was $30. Uh, this one is uh, uh, edited by Toby Janicki. Very good. I highly recommend it. Now, the Didache is a series of writings that are attributed to the apostles right after the death of Messiah. Because what was happening when you read the book of Acts, remember, was Gentiles were flooding into the faith at an overwhelming in overwhelming numbers. And all of these Gentiles are coming in. They're all pagans, every one of them. They all have their own gods. They all have their own customs. They don't know Hebrew. They've never even seen a Torah scroll. They don't, they don't know how to read Hebrew. The scriptures are not written uh, in their own tongue. And so... You can imagine what's going on. Everyone's bringing in all of their own ideas. Now, we have a lot of that same problem today in the church. People come out of the world, and they bring their own ideas in, and they start to mix it with their newfound Christian faith, and we end up with a perversion of God's word, a perversion of the truth, and we mix all sorts of things in it. Even worse, by the end of the first century in the beginning of the second century the church fathers who the church just heralds as the best thing since sliced bread but the church fathers were nothing more than greek philosophers philosophers and what they did is they brought in greek philosophy into the gospels into the into the tanakh into the word and perverted it even further Okay, when I talk about going back to the church fathers, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, you know, Justin Martyr and, and uh, Ignatius and Chrysostom and all of these guys. I'm talking about Abraham, Itzhak, and Yaakov. Those are the church fathers. Okay, and we have to understand that and know that. And the church has, as, as far as the church is concerned, the church fathers sit at the right hand of power. I mean, they quote the church fathers over and over and over again, and it's really a sad mistake. Okay, so uh, all of that to say the disciples have to come up with an understanding what is required of the Gentiles who are coming to faith. It was pretty clear cut for the Jewish people that came to faith, but we do know that most of the people that came to faith. Uh, after about 42 AD, were Gentiles. Up until 42 AD, not one Gentile came into the church. The book of Acts is not about the Christian church. There was no Christian church in the book of Acts. What it was, is how Paul defined it, he said, I'm a member of the Jewish sect called the Way. It was a sect of Judaism called the Way, and what it was was Jewish believers that had come to faith, they, they finally recognized that Yeshua, this guy Yeshua is actually the promised Messiah. And so they embrace him and voila, Messianic Judaism is born and uh, not the church. Now we can call it the church because the Hebrew word for the congregation or the assembly is the kahal. Uh, and it is translated into the Greek as the ecclesia. Uh, the, uh, the ecclesia which is the church. And so we have this etymology of all these words that coming together that all basically mean the same thing. But it's not the church in the fact of born again Christians. Remember, uh, uh, for the better part of the, new, uh, the first century, there is no such thing even as a New Testament. There's only the old. There's only the Tanakh. And nothing was canonized, nothing's made official 
until 325 at the Council of Nicaea. Okay, so the, the apostles are having a real problem here. What does a Gentile have to do when they come to faith? What's required of them? Okay, and that's what this book is all about. It's a very basic book, and it tells what's required. One, probably my favorite verse in the whole thing here is, they say, if you can keep Torah, if you can keep all of Torah, you're perfect in all your ways. Amen. That sounds like what James wrote, isn't it? It's exactly, and James got it from here. This, I mean, James helped write this. Okay, so he's able to quote that and say, you know, this is what we want. But then he goes on, then the writer's going to say, but if you can't keep it all, keep as much as you can. Okay, so that becomes very crucial to us and very important. Now, the reason I brought this up in this parasha is because the Didache in chapter 3, verse 10 says this, quote, Accept the things that happen to you as good, knowing that apart from God, nothing comes to pass. Okay? Uh, and, of course, we read that later on in, in Rabbi Shaul's writings, too. The same concept, the same idea. All things are working. In fact, that, I want to go over that scripture right now. Let's turn over there to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. 828 says, we are assured and know that God is being a partner in their labor. All things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Amen. So we know that all things are working together for good. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying all things, right? Somebody say all things. All, all, things. Things. all things. Now, we have a real problem with this, particularly in our circles. We, we're charismatic, Pentecostal, word of faith. That is our basis. That is our foundation here at Shiloh. It always has been. The problem that I see in this movement of Charismatic Pentecostal word of faith is we often don't consult the Father at all. We want what we want and we start demanding it. Then we wonder why we don't see things happen. Pastor Paul was saying this week it's important to find out the will of God. You know, when Kathleen and I go into a, an emergency room situation where somebody is on their deathbed, we always pray, Father, is this unto death or is this unto healing? we always pray that way and if it's time to death we pray that they go quick and fast and it doesn't matter to me what anybody in the room thinks unless the family insists that we pray for prayer pray for healing then we'll pray for healing because this person's dead already dead man walking we're just now trying to minister to the family so whatever brings peace to them does that make sense yeah so we have and this is why I was also saying this weekend, it's important to speak in tongues, because when you pray in tongues, it gives you the mind of Messiah. So listen to me when I pray, and you'll, you'll hear every time I always start praying in tongues, always, because I'm trying to get a handle on what is God doing and what is God saying here, because I'm just going to tell you how it is. Nobody walks around knowing what God is saying 24 seven. I know some people that think they do, but they're just deceived. Okay, nobody does that. We have to purposely seek God for his direction and understanding before we even have a clue. And even then you only have a slight measure of the picture. We see through the mirror dimly, then we'll see face to face. As soon as we think we're zeroing in on God, he's going to let us fall. Don't get too cocky with this. It's not smart. Be humble. Seek God. So we accept the things. All things are working together for good. 
you know, a lot of things happen in life. You know, the, the Bible says it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. And how many know you can take that scripture either? That's, that's both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is you need rain for crops. No rain, no crops. So it rains on both the righteous and the unrighteous. But it's also, rain is also symbolic or significant of hard times in life. And the word tells us it rains on the, on the righteous and the unrighteous. So there's going to be some bummer times. I mean, if there's no bummer times, how are you going to be perfected? Because you're perfected through suffering. You're not suffering when you're walking through the tall cotton, people. Are you? That's not suffering. Suffering hurts. Suffering is painful. Suffering is something you don't want to go through. Even the Lord didn't want to go through it. He prayed three times before going to the cross. Lord, is there any other way we could handle this? And finally, he submits to God's will, the Father's will. It's interesting, he didn't submit the first time. He questioned a couple of times, right? Finally, he says, your will be done, not mine. Let me get this one first, Tila. Hey, uh, Sharon has a question. <clears throat> okay, Sharon, unmute yourself and ask, ask the question. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, Pastor great. Bruce, you were, you were talking about the Didache. Yeah. And the early church in Acts was not like born again Christians, but I would submit that yes, they indeed were born again. Maybe not Christian, but they were born again Jews, that's for sure, because the Holy Spirit had already been given. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely point. right. Okay. Yeah, I probably didn't word that right, but let me say it this way. In the first century, there was no distinction between the church and the synagogue, really. They, they didn't have clear boundaries. The only people that believed in Messiah at all up until 42 AD were, were Jewish believers. And we know that because the book of Acts talks about under the rule of Claudius is when uh, um, Cornelius comes to faith, and Cornelius is the first recorded Gentile to come to faith, faith, and Claudius was ruling in 42 AD. So this is almost, this is nine years after the crucifixion, not one Gentile has come to faith. That's pretty astounding. So this is a Jewish movement. There's no doubt about it. Okay? Now, and because of that, they, they weren't called Christians. It's not like today where we have the church and we have the synagogue. We have the Christian and we have the Jew. And it's very clear distinction lines. Okay. Back then it wasn't clear at all. Remember when Rabbi Shaul got kicked out of the synagogue, he went right next door. In fact, it was a, it was a he went right next door to the synagogue and started the first messianic. And it was a, it was a wall. It was an adjoining wall. It was like a, uh, a townhouse duplex. duplex it was an adjoining wall to the synagogue and that's where the very first messianic synagogue was started are you done uh sharon i just have one other comment and i'm sorry this has nothing wait, wait, to do with you yeah we can't hear you oh <clears throat> let, me, let me see so yeah now we can you can hear me now okay yeah this really has nothing to do with what you've been talking about, but I find it really interesting that this is the first time I see the patriarch, the father, naming the children. Up until this point, it's been the mothers that have been giving them their names. Um, and I don't know what significance that has, but I think it's very interesting. Well, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the significance is either, but it'd be okay. an interesting I'm gonna, study. I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. Okay. Okay, hey, Taylor. Um, what you were talking about with suffering is the same thing. You know, it was amazing. It's is that working? Is the, is the green light on? Why don't you turn it up just a little bit? <laughs> Sharon, can you hear Tila speaking? Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Now you can. Go. Cool. It's amazing with what you're what you're saying because you know when you think about Yeshua, and and how much he loved, uh, and and he only did what the Father told him to do and stay with the Father told him to stay. It's the same thing with us as far as our love for others. Um, you're never gonna. You're not always gonna be accepted. You're not always gonna be accepted, and yet love pours out. It's right. because it, when you love the Father, the Father is loving through you. And there's a lot of people who reject you. They will absolutely reject you, and it hurts, you know, to be rejected. Yeah. Families, you know, you have you have brothers and sisters that you dearly love, and the minute you start talking about salvation or you talk about the Word, they immediately cut you off, and that yeah. and that hurts. But that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have right. is that kind of love that suffers through through yeah what we're doing. exactly we're going to be talking about uh rejection today a lot you know when i when i teach the word i like to teach from a practical perspective more than a theological perspective okay the reason for that is because a theological perspective doesn't help you as much as a practical application helps it's not it's valid it's necessary we need it and we do cover it listen guys the average person in this congregation knows more than most pastors that i know and i'll say that to any pastor i know why is that because you're being taught by pastors that have dug into the theological roots of our faith we're not just parroting tradition the tradition makes null and void the word of God, according to what Yeshua said. Remember that? It's very important that we get that. So I want to, I like to focus on the practical aspect of the, the practical application of the word. What does this mean for us and how do we apply it to our life? You know, you can come up with zingers all day long out of the word of God that everybody moves and awes over and it's all great. But then by Wednesday afternoon, everyone's forgotten and they're back polluted in sin. You know, uh, I don't see much use in that personally. And uh, and I will just tell you this, Yeshua dealt with the practical aspects. He never taught theology, ever. So we don't, although we, we want to understand our theology and what we believe, it's important to know what we believe and why. That's not the focus of our faith, guys. We can have all the theology down and go to hell. Let me tell you, the devil has got his theology down. He knows it. And uh, he's not going where we're going. Amen? All right. So in, in Roman numeral number two, one more. Uh, so practically, can we trust that this entire book is the word of God? Practically. Yeah, the Bible? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. The New Testament. And we trust that that's all the Word of God. Yeah. From Genesis to Revelation is, listen, and how do we do that? Because there's obviously books that are, in fact, I'm going to be reading out of a uh, extra curricular book today. Uh, but And we dig into all sorts of books besides the Bible, but they are not biblically canonized. This, the Bible, is what is accepted as God's full and complete word. We have to trust that at this point in time, even though there are some books that are mentioned in there, like the book of Jasher, okay, and Enoch, which are clearly alluded to and talked about, but they're not incorporated into the Bible, and that's okay because God didn't see fit to put them in. And we have to trust in that belief system because there has to be a bottom line somewhere. If there's no bottom line, then you're tossed to and fro by everything that comes along, right? So our bottom line is, is that that Bible that you're holding is all you need, right. period. Everything you need to know is in there. And, and let me tell you, sometimes that's a little disconcerting because there's a lot of blanks in the Bible. It says keep the Shabbat, but it never tells you how to keep it. It says keep all the festivals. It really doesn't tell you much about how to keep them. He leaves a lot of that up to us. Okay. Um, there's all kinds of things in there. 
is is it used to crack me up because you know on the west coast you know we would do baptisms and the women would show up in french bikinis and and on the west in the west coast church a, a skimpy bathing suit is is in a lot of places fairly accepted but we condemn smoking on the west coast as one of the biggest sins you can do on the east coast smoking is completely acceptable in the church see so there's so many variants in this equation uh, because God hasn't really spelled it out. And so we have to come to grips with that. Okay. And that's, that's kind of uh, what we do, but the word, as you hold it in your hand is that is the word of God. And, and it's everything you need to know to get to heaven and to walk with God, the side of heaven in a fairly good manner, right? Okay, so in Roman numeral number two in your notes, this too is for good. Now, what are we talking about here? What's What Joseph has gone through. Joseph is a teenager probably when he gets thrown into to the pit by his brothers, talk about rejection, 17 years old thrown into a pit, despised by his, they wanted to kill him. They were, they were prepared to kill him. And it was just by the grace of God that they didn't. They hated him. I mean, to, to seriously want to kill your brother, your blood physical brother, there's a lot of hate. It's running pretty deep. One thing you get mad and have a fist fight, you know, and two two days later you're best buds again. But you know, to hate somebody that much, that's that is a rejection to the max. Then he's sold into slavery. We read here that when he's taken before Pharaoh, he brought out of the dungeon, he's got a shave. You can imagine what he looks like. Hasn't had a haircut, no, no shave, dirty, filthy clothes. And he's been in there. For how long? We're not even told. He's been in there since Potiphar's <laughs> wife did her thing. Right. And we don't know how long that was. We know that it's been two years since the baker and the, and the uh, cup bearer had their dreams. So he's been in the dungeon at least two years. Ten plus two. Rabbi say 10 plus two, 12 and years. And you didn't take baths, you didn't watch color TV, you didn't lift weights, you were sitting in the dark, your hair growing long, and eating whatever slop they threw down the hole to you. You think, yeah, yeah, you're, you're literally, yeah, there's no flushing toilet here. You know what I'm saying? So this is the condition. As I was reading that, I was wondering, what would my attitude be? Well, I already know what my attitude would have been. Wouldn't have been good. Uh, because I've gone through these things. You know, I've shared when Kathleen was sick for all those years and I prayed and she never got healed. I got mad at God. In fact, I tore my ordination papers and threw them in the trash. Told God to get himself another boy. I wasn't doing this anymore. Those are my exact words. I don't recommend that because there's a price to pay for that kind of attitude. But that's where I felt rejected by God. I felt let down by God. I felt like he was, you know, favoring other people. I felt all sorts of feelings. Most pastors, if they're honest with you, will tell you that they wanted to resign so many times they can't even count. The number of times. Did you know the suicide rate for life insurance is the highest amongst pastors? Yeah, dentists get in there too. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but. Yeah. I worked with Yeah. Inflicts pain. Yeah. There you have it. Right in a. Yeah. yeah, a lot of pain, pain too. So, I mean, 
so you can see he's dealing with rejection. He's dealing with rejection from God. He's in there because he shared a word. Now, we talked last week or the week before. He was probably very immature in the way he shared this word. He probably should have used some better wisdom. But which one of us can say, well, we've always moved in the greatest of wisdom? Uh, we just can't say that. So he's feeling pretty, or he has the ability, or can I even say the right to feel very low here, very down, very depressed. And yet, in letter A, Joseph never fell into depression that we're told about. I'm sure he had some days better than others. I mean, that's just kind of life. You know what I mean? But he never fell into depression. He believed he was where God had placed him. Hey, buddy. Okay. He believed that he was where God had placed him. All right. Maria. Maria. When I read that, uh, the picture that I got was Esther. The same thing, he was placed in the, in the place where he was supposed to help the Jewish people to survive. Mm -hmm. Mordecai and Esther both. And when I was reading, he was in jail for 10 years, measure for measure, a year for each brother he spent in jail for what he did, because he he caused the problem. So that's interesting. Yeah, he definitely uh, didn't use any. Uh, he, provoked he provoked them. Yeah, and if you notice, he came out at the age of thirty, the same age that Yeshua came out yeah. to teach, yeah. and the same age that a priest is, is yeah. allowed to uh, participate. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. I want you to turn over to Genesis. Everyone go over to Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. Now, this is interesting because this has in it the same word that our parasha is named today. Obviously, a different reckoning of why or the meaning, but the same word. And it says in Genesis 4, 3, talking about Cain and Abel, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And then we know the rest of the story. I just want to read this verse because that term there in the course of time is the word miketz. Same word that we're talking about today in our parish of miketz, which means at the end. What's very interesting about this in Genesis 4 is we know that they already know about Torah here even though Torah is not written down yet. And how do they know that? This is the Shabbat. So it came about at the end of time. That's the end of the week. What's, what day is the end of the week? Sunday. Shabbat. No, yeah, not Sunday. Sunday is the first day. Seventh day is the Shabbat. So they're coming to the Lord's prayer, into the Lord's presence on the Shabbat, and they're, they're bringing their offerings. So already the tithe is initiated. The offerings are initiated. Uh, they understand about the Shabbat. This is because the oral tradition goes all the way back to Adam walking in the cool of the evening with God talking. And what do you think they're talking about? Not the Dodgers, okay? <laughs> they're talking about Torah. They already have this down, and so many people miss this. This isn't talking about, so it came about at the end of times, the last days. This is the beginning of the story, not the end. So what's happening here is he's referring this back to the Shabbat. And we know, and you, if you follow the conversation, God talks to Cain, he says, if you just do what you're supposed to do, everything's going to be okay. So Cain knew he was bringing the wrong offering. Cain was bringing the offering he wanted to bring. He was bringing the grain offering, the minka offering, okay? Uh, and actually, the word for offering, there is minka. The minka offering is the offering that was offered at 3 o'clock, and it was the grain offering. 
He's supposed to be bringing a lamb. That's why Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God and Cain's wasn't. Because God said, you bring the lamb in the morning. Then in the afternoon, you bring a lamb and the grave. See what I'm saying? So it's very important to understand this. So this means at the end. Now, we're talking about Joseph has been in, in jail now for these two years. So really what we're referring to now back into our parasha is the idea we're at the end of Joseph's confinement. And that's what that maquette's at the end for our parasha today is really referring to. Is coming to the end of this segment of his life. Okay, and he still has a pretty decent attitude going. And of course, we need to work on that ourselves. Now, Roman numeral three, Pharaoh's dreams came both with a prediction and a plan. With a prediction and a plan. I want you to go over to James. We're going to look at verse chapter one, verse two to eight from the English Standard Version. Two to eight. And here's what James says. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It sounds just like what Joseph is going through, doesn't it? It sounds just like what the Didache wrote. Count everything as good. And the same thing Paul wrote in Romans. All things are working together for good. Guys, we've got to get this one down. Just, just a show of hands. How many of you would say you had a bad week this week? Okay. <laughs> How many had a neutral week? How many had a good week? We have one hand for a good week. <laughs> yeah. So you guys have had a good week. Uh, now, how many know that that's going to flip flop? And if I did the same question next week, different hands would go for different things. Because you don't have a good week every week, unless you come to a place in your life where you're able to believe that this too is good. And that's our goal. That's what we're shooting for, where you believe God and trust God so much that no matter what transpires, you can say, you know what? God's in control, and this is good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, I doubt that any of us have arrived at that place 100%. I know I'm, I'm much better at that today than I was 20 years ago. How many would say you're doing better with that than you, you were 20 years ago? See, that's called growth. And if should the Lord tarry, we go another 20. How many know you're going to be better in 20 years from now than you are right now? Right? This is our, our the progression of our growth. All right. So this is very important. So let me finish the description and I'll get to you, Ed. So count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various uh, meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces in steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many want verse 4 in their life? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, we all do, right? So he says, okay, then you got to go through trials to get it. God doesn't just dish this out like free candy. Uh-uh, I wish he did, but he doesn't. No, you've got to go through these trials. And trials, boy, if you make a list of what trials constitute, it's all over the place. It, it, all sorts of things can be trials. Okay? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Now, what are we talking about in our parasha? We're talking in Roman numeral three. That the, the dreams come not only with a prediction, but with a plan. So our job is incumbent upon you and I now, when we're going through various kinds of trials and tribulations, we want, how many, how many always know what's going on when you're going through some suffering? How many most of the time don't know what the heck's going on? Most of the time, I don't have a clue what's going on 
while I'm in the midst of the suffering. I find out after the fact. Because I, here's, here's, the, here's the truth, guys. None of us start seeking God on what it means before we enter it. Do, do you? You don't even know it's coming. It takes you a while just to get your mind set around, hey, this is good. <laughs> then you start going, well, why is it happening? People come to me as a pastor all the time and say, why is this happening? I go, I don't know. How would I know? I haven't even asked the Lord. This is your life, not mine. I've got my hands full trying to figure out what's going on in my life. You think I know what's going on in the lives of 200 people? I don't. See what I'm saying? So we've got to have a sober judgment. We've got to be honest with ourselves. Stop playing spiritual, religious, foolish, parasitical games. Right? You, you don't sit at the right hand. You're just, I like what John Wimber used to say. He said, I'm just a fat man trying to get to heaven. <laughs> and a guy moved in such power. It was incredible. I resemble. Yeah. So he says here in James, he says, but let him ask in faith. Or he says, if any man lacks, lacks wisdom, in verse 5, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, what's the context? Wisdom. This isn't about, you know, well, I want a new Corvette. So I'm going to ask God, he's going to give it to me. This specifically is talking about wisdom in the midst of trials. This isn't even talking about biblical wisdom, necessarily. This is talking about you going before the Father when you're in the midst of suffering and trials and saying, what's this all about? What's going on here? And usually we go to the Lord, if we're, again, if we're honest with ourselves, I would submit that most people go to the Lord trying to seek wisdom so they can get out of the suffering. I mean, that's why I go to the Lord with asking for wisdom in the midst of suffering most of the time, because I just want to get out of the oven. It's not because I want to grow from it. Now, every once in a while, I get a breakthrough. I go, oh, man, this is terrible. What can I grow? How can I grow through this? But how many know every attitude in your in your body has got to be perfect before you do that? Right? Now I'm just speaking on a very practical level because it, guys, this is where we live every day. You, you don't live with your nose stuck in the lexicon. That's not real life. Real life is you're out doing your job. And you smash your finger with the hammer to the point where you go to the hospital that bad and you say well this is good lord what what's, what's going on here what do you want to teach me what, what what what's the plan here see that's it otherwise you go to the hospital just to get bandaged up so you can get back on the job and make some more money right Okay, so then we go down and uh, he says, uh, let me finish this scripture and then I got to get to Ed first. He says here, but let him ask without doubting. Now, what are we talking about? We're not talking about all prayer in general, although that's a perfectly good concept. We don't want to doubt when we pray, right? But what is the context? Remember, when you're reading the Bible, it's context, context, context. And what we're talking about here is finding wisdom, finding a plan in the midst of God doing something in your life. Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is tossed and driven by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Okay, so <clears throat> we ask wisdom. <clears throat> when God begins to speak to you, you don't doubt it. <clears throat> you don't fight it. Okay, you accept it. You, that's confession. You come into agreement with it. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, then last verse, and then I'll take those questions. First Corinthians 10.13 from the English Standard Version says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. The first thing we think when we go through a trial, oftentimes, is why am I going through this? I'm the only one. I hear that even on a, uh, on a church level. Why is our church going through this? We're the only church I know of going through this. You're never the only one. Never. Who do you think you are? You're just an average person. Right? Lots of people are going through this, and it's common. What you're going through, the word says, is common. You're not alone in this. The first thing the devil wants to do is separate you to make you think that there's something wrong with you. Now, you're not seeking God for wisdom. You're thinking, what's wrong with me? Am I being punished? And, we're, and this is what the Bible calls vain imaginations. And we're jumping from one vain imagination to the next. We're not seeking God for wisdom. You see how we get caught up in this whole cycle. You've got to be so careful with that because it causes us to live our life going in circles. And it's true, everything in the Bible is cyclical, but we don't want to go in circles, right? You and I weren't called to go in circles. We were called to go make Aliyah. Right. And of course, I like Pastor Paul's definition. Aliyah is actually circular too. It's just a ascending circle, spiral. Right? Okay. So he says, it's all common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. I can't tell you how many times somebody has either said to me or I thought it myself, I can't go through this. And right away, you're, you're coming against what God says. You're not seeking God for wisdom. You're drawing conclusions that you're basing on nothing. You're basing them on your depression and your and your rejection and your and your hopelessness. You, I can't go any longer. I'm, I'm, I can't take any more. Even pastors. This is why the suicide rate is highest amongst pastors. Of all people, shouldn't they be the most hopeful? Yes. Or at least up there somewhere, right? And yet they're killing themselves. Why do people kill themselves? Because they're hopeless. Because they, they're, they've convinced themselves they can't go one more step, one more day. This is why I'm always doing my crazy little stunt out there in the sanctuary where I take that one more labored step and I say, you can do, I don't care where you're at today, you can take one more step. Amen. You can do it. I'm not saying you want to. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you can take one more step. I'm not talking about taking a 4,000 mile journey here, although one step after another will add up to 4,000. Don't focus on the 4,000. Focus on the one. That's what the Lord said. Don't worry about tomorrow. Keep your eyes focused here on today because today's got enough problems of its own, right? Okay. So, um, and he says, he, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape. So there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, it's dark. And in the, in the tunnel, it's, it's like pitch black sometimes. That's not a comfortable place for us to be. No coincidence that this is red during the time. Yeah, light. yeah, you're you're exactly right. It's light. There is for you and I, guys. There is always a light up there. Now you may have such a distance to still go that you can't see the light, but sometimes that's just because you're you got to go around a corner. It's not that far away. How many have ever seen that? You you can't see the light, and you you think of the tunnel is just perfectly straight. You go, oh my gosh. I got a long ways to go. You take one more step and you go around a corner and there's the light. 
Okay. And he says, he's given you a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. He that endures to the end, what? Shall be saved. And that's not talking about salvation going to heaven, guys. If it were, then you get to heaven by works. And that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you're going to be saved through this event. And why are you even going through this event? Because as we read earlier, it's causing you to persevere and bring endurance and growth. In other words, this too is good. And you can tell the Lord you don't like it. I tell the Lord that all the time. I don't like this. I might as well tell him he already knows. <laughs> I don't like this. But let's do it. Take my hand. You know my prayer. I always say, be gentle. Be gentle with me. Right? I, I find that's a good prayer for me. Okay, Ed. Yeah, this all falls under, you know, being able to please God with faith only. You know, I don't think Joseph was in the dungeon thinking, well, I'm having a good day or a good week. No. But the faith in his heart was telling him, you know, because we're looking, we're looking at an eternal process. Yeah. You know, so last night I had a bad night, but when you asked, did I have a good week? I raised my hand yeah. because I'm looking at a bigger time frame. Right. Last night I stepped on my glasses, oh, you know, so yeah. I'm wearing my backup glasses right now and I have to take my brand new glasses. I mean, brand new frame, brand new lenses. Yeah. Gotta get a bitch, you know. And then a few weeks back, I had some sort of virus that lasted about a week. I had a bad week, but if you ask me, hey, how was your month? I had a great month. Yeah. So I think you know, faith is this eternal thing that we live in. Yeah. And so I think if we use our faith, which we're using our faith to try to please Amen. God, Amen. then we could say, hey, this is gonna work out to good. You know, I look at that week of having that virus as yeah. you know, it's gonna be a year or so before I get that virus again. That's good. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a good definition. Faith is, I love the cat hanging by the, by his paws off. Yeah. Hang in there, baby. That's faith. Faith isn't always going around with a finger painted smile on your face saying, well, praise God, I'm blessed, highly favored, everything's great. That isn't faith. That's just a statement. You may not even believe it. You're just conditioned to say it. Okay. Faith is the one like Yeshua, how many would say Yeshua moved in faith? Well, he's three times he asked the father, you know what? I don't think going to the cross is such a hot idea. Is there, is there another way? Is there another way? He said it three, three times before he finally says, now was he in, moving in lack of faith? Well, I know lots of Pentecostals that would have jumped up and pointed the fingers at him and said, man, you lack faith. I rebuke that. And who's wrong? Well, it's not the Lord, right? It's the Pentecostals. So we've got to calm down a little bit. And I love what Ed just said about faith is this long-term thing. Even when you are having a bad day and you end up with a crummy attitude, you can still be a mighty person of faith. A momentary affliction. It's a momentary <laughs> thing, right? You, that's still being a person of faith. Now, would you prefer to go through the trial and tribulation with a smile or weeping, wailing, whining, and gnashing your teeth? That's your call. It's better to do it with a good attitude because it does work out better for you. But, you, but if as long as you choose to go through it, you're moving in faith, baby. Hang in there. Right? Make sense? Very important that we get that. Because we have this skewed concept of what faith is. And we end up chasing our tail like a dog sometimes, trying to get a hold on faith. Faith isn't working yourself up to believe something. Faith is, I do believe it. And I don't want to smile. I don't want to sing about it right now. But I believe it, and I'm going to do it. That's faith. Maria. Two things. Three lines that was scratched into the wall of Oswood concentration camp. I believe in the sun, 
even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I do not feel it. I believe in God, even when he's silent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I wanted to say about- That is faith. That's, that's faith. faith. And you know what? The Bible even says, I love you in my silence. God is silent for some, sometimes. He's just not talking to you. You go, why? I don't know. He's just, he was 400 years. He never talked to anybody between the, between the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. So you have to understand there's times when God is silent. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong necessarily. In fact, I would have to say most of the time because God, if God gets mad at you and gives you the silent treatment because you did something corny or stupid or sinful, uh, that doesn't speak real high of his character. Now, I don't think that's the cause most of the time. I think most of the time God is just silent for whatever reason. And at that point in time, he wants you, like the guy in the concentration camp that wrote that, just to hold on to what you know and you go okay it's pretty dark here but i'm doing this i'm not turning back period you're you're my second thing about sinning and uh why when we ask god why uh this is happening it uh it says when joseph told them he was going to throw them into jail unless they brought their younger brother, they question why, why are we in jail? Yeah. Oh, what did we do? We didn't do anything. And then one of them said, yeah. it was probably, truly we are guilty yeah. concerning our brother. Yeah. So they went back and thought, this is what we're being punished for. And Reuben said, didn't I tell you? Do not sin against the boy, and you wouldn't listen. Now comes the reckoning of his blood. Yeah. And that was 12 years after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Mita can negative measure for measure. Whatever that goes. You know, it, whatever you sow, good or bad, is coming upon you. Now, grace lightens the tidal wave sometimes, I think. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, but it's, and the other biblical principle, you're going to reap more than you sowed. You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. So you're going to get back more than you gave every time. That one uh, piece of insight, yeah, the question is just when. That one insight for me has probably affected my life as much as any other scripture. Because I stop and I think about things or try to. I go, okay, what, what am I sowing here? Because this is going to come back on me somewhere. And so I want to make sure I sow good seed. Why? Because I'm trying to plan for my future. Right? You want good seed coming up tomorrow, not bad seed. Thank you. Midah, Kanega, Midah. Measure for measure. Okay, go ahead, Sharon. Um. <clears throat> Pastor, I'm sorry, this is more of a personal um, thing that I want to share. And um, we listened in on YouTube Friday night, even though neither one of us felt mentally able to even comprehend what was going on. Right. How are you feeling today, by the way? I'm much better. Good. And Bill is incrementally better as well. Okay, good, good. So um, we are, thank you, Father. But 
I, I just wanted to share, I don't know who was there on Friday night, but how much it blessed us. I mean, I felt like I was not there mentally connect, connected it, because I was so sick. Um, and Bill the same way, but he was totally listening to everything that was happening. And uh, I just wanna thank you and that you should know how powerful God's spirit worked in us um, and on the mountain, actually. I just, um, the Dome of Shalom, that I, that, that's been my um, fervor of, of prayer. Um, and when you, when you cast out that illness from the mountain, and from the homes, Yahai, it existed, it happened. Yeah. So I just want to thank you, and um, I'm sorry to interrupt oh, no. your teaching, but um, it was so good. Yeah, thanks. It's always good to hear back, because a lot of times you don't hear, and um, we never know quite what the effect is. So thanks for telling us that. A lot of people did report in that they were very blessed just watching it on the YouTube. Yeah. So, good. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and move on now. You want to turn that down? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the dreams came with a prediction. Joseph was able to predict what was going, what the dreams meant, but then he went on to provide a the wisdom of what to do about it now the way that the the gifts of the spirit are distributed amongst the uh the, the congregation is you know one has uh the gift of interpretation the other has the gift of uh you know uh, tongues the other has a gift of healing uh miracles and so on and so forth we don't all have all of the gifts Okay, now I do personally believe that it is possible to have all of the gifts. I personally have moved in all of the gifts, I believe. Um, but, there, but I have my strong suits where the Lord uses me most often. Now, the reason the Lord doesn't give it all to one person is because if you had everything, you wouldn't feel the need to depend on your brothers and sisters. And God knows how important it is that you and I become one. We need to understand we need each other. So don't think that you're going to get all the gifts and you're just going to not be in need of, of other people. Now, in this case, he does have the plan and he has the wisdom. And a lot of times you'll have the you'll get the plan and the wisdom. But a lot of times the plan will come forth and then the wisdom comes later through somebody else. Don't shun that. That's that's OK. You want to seek God. Well, what does that mean? I don't know if, if how many of you have ever received a word from me, and I often will say, um, does that mean anything to you? I give the word. Uh, and now, from my perspective, I know it's a word from God. I mean, I'm pretty convinced. Otherwise, I wouldn't have given it in the first place. So I'm pretty convinced, but it, it's not me that has to be convinced. It's you. So I'll say, does that mean anything to you? And the person will go, well, I'm not sure. And then I go, okay, then go home and pray about it. See what the Lord shows you. I'm certainly not going to rebuke them like, oh, you know, you need more faith. You need to listen to me. And blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. You need to just get with God and see if it means something. Does it resonate? This is what the word says. Let the prophets test the prophets. Let, let the people test the prophetic words okay but seek wisdom on it now sometimes the lord tells me i got a word one night years and years and years ago uh it was at our friday night service and i said here's what the lord says one of you when when you're driving home tonight you're going to get very ill here's what you do you get out you pull the car over immediately get out get on your knees and begin praising god and you'll be healed and it happened just like that. You remember that? Uh, I mean, I don't always get that. But that time I did. 
I knew something, I knew this was going to happen, and this was the remedy for it. Other times I know this is what God's saying, but I don't have a clue what the remedy is. That's where somebody else has got to jump in. See? When we do that, we start working as a team. And that's crucial that we do that because not none of us have all of the gifts and all of the anointing and never will. Use the microphone, Jalene. Oh, just to add to that, you know, we all have to move into the gifts because when one starts, it sparks in another and then it sparks in another yeah. and then it sparks in another. So if, like, especially like maybe on Friday nights, you know, a lot of people may, maybe hold back. And it's like, you, you don't understand the significance that if you don't get up and give what it is God had for you to share, right. it may not spark in somebody else what they have on the inside of them. Because your word, your voice, you know, is absolutely, it, it does something in the spirit realm that mine might not, or yeah. his might not, or, you know, so you have to give what the Lord puts on your heart to give because it sparks those gifts to continue to flow. Yeah, and, and even the way they're delivered, you know, two people can give the same word and some people receive from one and some receive from the other. I mean, how many of you... Uh, liked the writings of Peter more than Paul's writings. You know, we, we have preferences and it's okay. Uh, we've already talked about how Joseph didn't deliver the word properly. Well, you know, a lot of times people will give me a word. I go, man, you know, you could have really given that in a very good way, but instead it's this in your face kind of a thing. Now, <laughs> now there's a time for the word to be in your face. There's a time when God gets in your face, but it's not every time. And I would submit to you, it's probably not most times. He ministers to you based on the personality that you are and the temperament that you are. I'm kind of a bull in the china shop, so I'm not, I don't, I don't deliver words often the way somebody that's very, very, very ultra sensitive appreciates. And it's just how it is. And you know what? I'm probably never going to be the guy that delivers those words the best. Somebody else can deliver those. But if you're relying on me to get all the words or one of the other pastors or elders, then how many people are getting ripped off ultimately? See, God wants you to step out. Here's the deal. The worst is, the worst thing that can happen is you're wrong. I mean, is that like uh, a shock for any of us? Have you, you're not going to be stoned. Have you ever been wrong before? You think you might be wrong again? This is a safe place. This is where you learn. Because ultimately, we need to take the gifts outside the walls of the church. You can't be wrong out there. This is training. You can be wrong here all day long. That's why I tell you, don't go, thus saith the Lord. If you say, thus saith the Lord, you better be right, or you just signed yourself up for a world of woe. <laughs> That's reaping what you've sown. If you try to put words in the mouth of God, you're in deep trouble. So don't go. It's Why not just say, you know, I think this is what the Lord's saying. Does that mean anything to you? I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. Now, there's times when I do. And I do that with fear and intrepidation, honestly. Reminds me of the one someone gave a word once and said, thus saith the Lord, I am not here. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen here, but I just. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say the Lord, I am not here. Yeah. Obviously, that wasn't a word from God. And the person said, Thus saith the Lord. So I don't know what happened to them. They could be in heaven already. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. All right. In Roman numeral number four now, I want to go over to Genesis chapter 41. Let's go over there. Je Genesis chapter 41. And we're going to look at verse 45 from the English Standard Version. And it says this, 
And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonath Paneah. And he led him, or he gave him in marriage, Asenath, uh, uh, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Okay, so Pharaoh's happy. He's a happy camper now. Now, can you imagine Joseph, first and foremost, giving, you think he was a little bit intimidated by Pharaoh giving this word? I mean, when remember what happened to the uh, the baker? Yeah. Two years earlier, that word didn't work out so well for the baker. It was right on, but it didn't work out so well. Can you imagine going before Pharaoh and trying to interpret this dream when all of his magicians have already failed? He's in a bad mood, and you're going to tell him what his dream means and what to do about it. This is faith. He said, you know what? I think this is from God. You know, I've always wondered, did the prophets hear audible voices from God? Or did they hear from God the way we hear from God? I think it's probably some of each. But, you know, they didn't just have this direct line to heaven. Did they? They had to move in faith. They stepped out. They said, you know what? This is, I think this is the Lord. Right? Ed. Well, I, I think Joseph was probably, you know, like, like you or any of us to get a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, or, you know, when you see someone's affliction, I know, you know, for me, that's, a tough thing you want to be right but then the spanking you get afterwards for not doing it is even you know it can be really tough to handle it you know and yeah. the lord will come to you and say hey you know why didn't you give that word or why didn't you give that knowledge yeah. so that you could minister to that person and so i think that's where joseph probably was even though he saw you know he saw the baker he saw the you know all the bad stuff happened yeah. to the magicians you know this is what god has shown me and, yeah. you know, you have to be at that place where you got to be confident. And, uh, hey, yeah. you know. Exactly right. Live in the truth. It's exactly right. And it, it, the safer method is not just being silent. Okay. Don't think that's the safe play. Because it isn't. Because if God gives you a word for somebody, or he wants you to pray for somebody, and you don't do it, have you impacted that person's life? Yes. It's very easy to say, well, the Lord will send somebody else. Well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. I, you don't know. You don't know that. And I, there's still things that I regret, words that I got from the Lord that I regret not doing. I mean, I've shared with you before, I'll, years ago when we were brand new believers, the Lord gave me a word for this family in a pizza parlor to buy them their drinks. And I was like brand new. We were just a few months old in the Lord, I think. It was that long ago. And I didn't buy them drinks. And I regret it to this day. I'm telling you, I missed God. You go, well, what's the big, buy him some coats. What's the big deal? I missed God. And how did it affect their lives? I have no idea. But I know I missed it. And I also know I'm never getting that opportunity back again. It's gone. Guys, playing a safe is not the smart move. You want to give the word, but you want to give it in a palatable way. You, you, otherwise you end up like Joseph. Everybody hates you. Oh, here comes the prophet of doom again. Yeah. You know, and people shut you off. You've got to do, do, and be all things to all men. You've got to deliver it so it's going to minister to the person you're giving it to. It doesn't matter who you are, what you think. How many times have I said, God doesn't care what you think? 
<laughs> I, I can't be any clearer on that. God doesn't care. He's never asked your opinion on anything. He, he just doesn't. He doesn't need your opinion. He doesn't want to be, I'd say, confused by it, but he wouldn't be confused by it. He'd just go, well, that was dumb. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yes. So, guys, don't just play it safe. Let's start stepping out and move in the gifts. And if you only have half the picture, oftentimes in our meetings, we've seen somebody give the first half of a word, and they go, that's all I've got. And then the next, and then another person stands up and gives the second half. Guys, just because you only got half the word, don't make something up. Oh no, that is not smart at all. You're now adding to God's word. And we don't do that. If you say something and that's all you've got, that's all you've got. But you know what? God will either bring the rest or what you got is enough. You go, well, I didn't understand it. Well, who do you think you are that you have to understand it? Somebody brought their uh, somebody brought their niece or their granddaughter. Remember that day? And I went up to her. I, I'd never seen her before, but, but I had a word for her. And I went up and I called her. Oh, it was Melissa's granddaughter. What, what did I call her? Oh, I walked up. Now, I don't use that term. I mean, you know, I'm way too macho for that. <laughs> I don't go around calling kids pumpkin and. You don't mind that. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, like I said, a bull, a bull in the china shop is probably the proper term. But I went up to her and I said, hi, pumpkin, what's your name? And, and she was so taken back because that was her special name. I'd never seen her before that night. I'd never seen her since. Wow. But she knew God was speaking to her wow. because I called her Pumpkin. And I thought, Pumpkin, come on, Lord. I don't talk like that. Pumpkin, are you kidding me? That's weird. <laughs> Probably. But see, the Pumpkin, that was it. That was the whole thing right there. Boom. Let me get Ed first. He was right. Ed was going first. Then I got to move on, guys, because I'm, you know, back to missing God. I, there's two <laughs> instances in my life where I really miss and I regret. Like you said, I vividly see those instances. One of them when I was a young Christian, and then one probably about four or five years ago, I was in uh, BJ's brew house, and God told me to go pray for this man at this booth, and I didn't. And I still see the image yeah. of being of being there in BJ's brew house, exactly what yeah. booth he was in, exactly oh, yeah. what he looks like. And I still see that, you know. And after we left and drove off, I, you know, I confess, I said, Lord, I missed you. And so I want to say as an encouragement to everybody, the worst thing that could happen, you know, if God says go pray for that person or go lay hands on that person or whatever, is that they reject you and say, No, don't pray for me. And that's only happened one time. And following the Lord almost 30 years, when you go yeah. up to somebody and say, hey, can I pray for you? Yeah. You know, uh, 999,000 yes. times out of a million, they're going to say yes. Exactly. Good. Ken, quickly, and then we're going to move. Oh, you, you done? Oh, Marie had your hand up? No, spiritually. Spiritually. And I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to see that. <laughs> One of your gifts. That's true. Regarding your your reference to, to uh, talking to that girl pumpkin, it's where it says in verse thirty three, when Joseph gives the interpretation, then he says, "Now let the Pharaoh." Yeah. Uh, that is still part of the yeah. message, right? Yeah. Because I was reading that. Even if you were presented in front of the Pharaoh, you do not talk to him, much right. less sit there and give him advice and tell him, yeah. now, this is what you're going to do. It's very bold. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. You could that lose your head over that he real would easy. Kill you for just talking yeah. to him. But he said, now I hope that the, the Pharaoh has peace. See, he, he, he's, 
Joseph has grown here. Right. He has now learned how to deliver a word. I would say the delivery is just as important as the word itself and the timing. You know, you and the delivery and the timing are probably harder to get than the word itself. I was just going to share um, at this time, he, you know, he, he has grown, but at this time, the first two dreams that he ever had have still not come to pass. So he wasn't, he may yeah, have been growing, true. yeah. but remember, years before as a child with a coat yeah. of many colors, his family were going to bow down to him. Yeah. It still had not happened. Yeah, yeah you're right after all these years. All right, let's move on. In, uh, so we see that he gets a wife now in Roman numeral four, as, uh, as literally means her name means belonging to the goddess Neith. Now, this, this story, the story of Joseph is actually Neith, Neith N E I T H, belonging to the goddess Neith. N E I T H. Joseph is, for me, the story of Joseph is one of my all time favorite stories in the word. I just love this story. And, uh, and, and Joseph is honestly one of my heroes in the Bible. And now he's taking on this wife who's a total pagan. This is like, wow. Of course, the, the sages come up with the idea that this gal is actually uh, Dinah the the uh, daughter of, of Jacob, who was, you know, raped by the, the Shechemite prince, remember? And he now uh, has his daughter, Dinah, who we never read about. The rabbis, though, in their writings, are, they always write so that the Jews come out looking good. Okay? And that's okay, but you just have, when you're reading Jewish material, you have to always understand that. Uh, it, it's kind of like the Greeks. They they always look good when they write too. You know what I mean? You know, you know, you know. Watch big fat Greek wedding, and you'll you know. Did you know that word comes from the Greek word? Uh, you know, everything starts with Greek, you know, and uh, except the Windex. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. Well, there you, well, there you have it. Then I I just learned something new. The Windex does work. Okay. I'll try that. Who knows? So anyway, the, the name Neith literally means the terrifying one. So this goddess, she's not some little hillbilly goddess, okay? She is the mother of all gods in Egypt. She is the mother of all snakes and crocodiles. No, no, I'm just giving you this as extra, no extra charge for this. Is that actual? This is, this is what, it, this is. Yeah, this is, when you go into Egyptology, uh, this is, the, this is what this gal's name means. I mean, this is who she is. She's the mother of all gods. She's the mother of all snakes and crocs. She's also known as Astarte. Have we ever heard that one? Easter and Ishtar. Those are the same name, just in different dialects. Uh, probably Ashereth as well. And here is what she is quoted as saying. I am all that has been, all that is, and all that will be. This gal is nasty. Okay, and yet she's being married to Joseph, who is a type of the Messiah, type and shadow. And in fact, two of the tribes are her children. The plot thickens. Okay, so let's move on. Whether he had a choice or not, this is what he got. Well, yeah, I'm just saying, it wasn't. 
but but God uses this, and it's very interesting because of and and I'm going to talk to you about why this is important for us. The the picture that's being painted here in letter A, she is a type of the church. Just like Joseph is a type and shadow of Messiah, she's a type and shadow of the church. The, the church, the kahal, the assembly, the congregation of the Lord. Yeah. The, good one or the, bad one? the good one. The church, the real believers. Okay. And why would I say that? Because we all come out of the paganism. Every one of us, that's where we started, basically. And for the church at large, that's definitely where it started. Everybody, right? Frank, did you have something? I, I didn't know my hand was up, but. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> that was probably Maria's spiritual hand showed up over there. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Uh, yeah, why would God do something like that? Pair up Joseph with an evil partner? Well, that's a good question. I mean, does he do things like that still? Yes. <laughs> he does do things like that. <laughs> yeah, what are you saying about your wife here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hosea marries the prostitute, Gomer. Uh, we have four, um, we always say just Gentiles in Messiah's bloodline, but but they were more than just Gentiles. I mean, um, Tamar, you know, was a Canaanite woman. Uh, he was from the house of Shem. Well, that's what the Jews say. Yeah, that's what the Jews say. She was from yeah, Adula. It, it, so, you know, Bathsheba was, a, uh, she was married to a Hittite general. The Hittites were one of the giant tribes. Ruth was an Edomite or a, a Moabitess. Okay. Um, so God does this all the time. Now, the thing that we have to be careful of, Rahab was a harlot. And there's a good shot that there's a good chance that she became uh, Caleb's wife later. Yeah, and there's some there's some there is some evidence for that. Who knows? But but uh, so we see that God has blended in these people. Um, we we really don't know why God does this. We know there's a type and shadow. We know that there's symbolism that comes out of it, so on and so forth. But God could have done a lot of symbolism with other people. We talked just a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Vince was talking about how, uh, uh, you know, we went to Laban's house to, to get a, a bride for, for Itzhak. Uh, or, uh, yeah, for Itzhak. See, so, and Laban was an idol worshiper. In fact, Rachel steals one of his idols, brings it back with her. So um, we, I don't think we really know or understand why he does all the things he does. And I think sometimes he does them just to let us know that he has a plan that's much bigger than our, us. Uh, and I'm okay with that. I'm satisfied with that. You know, I, you know me, I don't, I don't ask too many questions that there aren't answers for. I am a question asker, however, and I will ask questions and I will dig for answers, but I don't spend the rest of my life digging because some things we just don't understand. You just have to go, this is what God's doing. Now, I want to read to you about her because this will start to, to fill us in. She is a type of, of the church. Actually, let me do B. B, her name is then changed to Osnot. This is her Jewish name. Now, where do we get this from? We get this from. Um, Osnat? Yeah. O-S-N-A-T. O-S-N-A-T, right. And I'm going to read it from the complete Jewish Bible here. Pharaoh called Yosef by the name Zafnat Panecha and gave him as his wife, Osnat, the daughter of Potiphar, 
priest of On. Okay, so this is the Jewish name that has also been included into the Hebrew scripture for us. Okay, now this uh, this name. Um, means uh, city of refuge, city of refuge, okay? Now, let me read to you. This is from uh, a book called Joseph and Asthenes, or however you say her name, Asina. This is from this book. It's a first century uh, pseudo-pictographical writing that expounds on her character, okay, and who she is. The work is called Joseph and Seneth. It's a literary creation of a Greek-speaking Jewish author living sometime near the apostolic era, okay? Uh, we don't know who the writer is or where he came from, but we can infer some things about him from his writing. He wrote in Greek, he had an interest in things Egyptian and seemed to have firsthand knowledge of Egyptian geography. In fact, he was probably an Egyptian Jew living in Alexandria at the time. That was a huge uh, place where Jews gathered when they were living in Egypt. Whoever he was, he looked, uh, he took a very positive view of converts to Judaism. It's possible that he himself was a convert to Judaism. Joseph and Asneath is the love story between Joseph and his Egyptian bride. In the story, Asneath is portrayed as a breathtakingly beautiful virgin daughter of the Egyptian priest. She's devoted to her idolatry and worships all the gods of Egypt. She is the, she, she, worships, she worships the mother of all gods, okay? Yet when she lays eyes on Joseph, she is so smitten with him that she says, quote, I did not know that Joseph is a son of God. Now, now this is written in Egyptian uh, writings, you know, so she's now starting to expose this whole story. Or not she, but the writer of this book. She tries to woo him, but he's not interested. He rebukes her for her idolatry, and she's filled with shame. Now, some of the rabbis have now made the, in, in, uh, the assumption or the insinuation this is actually Potiphar's wife. The problem with that is uh, well, there's a lot of problems. We won't get into that right now. But if it is Potiphar's wife, you can see the rebuke here would cause a retribution. Having fallen utterly in love with Joseph, she destroys all her idols, repents for seven days in sackcloth and ashes, and calls on the God of Joseph. Uh, during the seven days of repentance, a heavenly man appears to her. He's described in the writing as, quote, a man in every respect similar to Joseph, except that his face was like lightning and his eyes like sunshine and the hairs on his head like a flame of fire of a burning torch and his hands and feet are like iron shining forth from a fire. Wow. I mean, this is a description that Daniel gives, Daniel and Enoch give of the, of the Messiah. Okay. The heavenly Joseph man is similar to the son of man Descriptions in the books of Daniel and Enoch, yeah. Uh, the Joseph man speaks to Asenath, saying, take courage, for behold, your name was written in the book of the living in heaven in the beginning of the book, as the very first of all, your name was written by my finger, and it will not be erased forever. Now he's talking about the book of life. Hmm. Behold, from today you will be renewed and formed anew and made alive again, and you will eat the blessed bread of life and drink the blessed cup of immortality and anoint yourself with the blessed ointment of incorruptibility. Sounds like Paul's writings. And your name shall no longer be called Asenath, but you shall be called City of Refuge. It, what a powerful writing this is, because you... Because in you, many nations will take refuge in the Lord God, the Most High, and under your wings, many peoples will be sheltered, and behind your walls will be guarded those who attach themselves to the Most High God in the name of repentance. Asthena's encounter with the divine Joseph man is followed by her conversion into a worshiper of the Lord God, Most High. She confesses her sins, washes herself from the ashes of her repentance. She dresses herself in a wedding garment and awaits 
for her beloved to return. The Pharaoh of Egypt informs her, the Lord, the God of Joseph has chosen you as a bride for Joseph because he is the firstborn son of God. Remember, he's a type and shadow Messiah. And you shall be called the daughter of the Most High. This is like reading the Bible. At last, Joseph and Asenath are married, after which Asenath says to Joseph, your father Israel is like a father to me. Grafted in, Joseph and Asenath have, uh, is an important work because it represents a first century typology of both Joseph and Asenath. In the mind of the writer, Joseph and as I say Asenath, but that's, it's wrong. Joseph represents a Messiah character. He is even called the firstborn son of God. The divine Joseph man gives Asenath the, the, to eat from the blessed bread and the cup. These seem to be a clear allusion to the master's table. Um, and it goes on here. The imagery uh, is so familiar to us as believers that it's astonishing. And this is actually written before Messiah even comes on the scene. So you can see that God's storyline has been written from long ago, from, in fact, the creation of, of the foundation of the earth, okay? So in letter C, she is a Gentile grafted in through faith. We see that even in her story here. She's a Gentile grafted in through faith. B, uh, her name was changed to Osnath. Okay, so she's a Gentile grafted in by faith. So the grafting in process of the heathens and the pagans of the world has been part of God's plan since day one, right? And specifically as the bride, okay? Specifically as the bride. So Romans 11, we won't read it for sake of time, but Romans 11, 11 through 18, talks about the grafting in process, right? And then Ephesians 2, 11 through 16 talks about the Ephesians being grafted, or the Ephesians, the Gentiles being grafted in through faith. Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. So she is a clear picture of God taking a pagan from whatever level possible because she's the she worships the mother of all gods. Taking this pagan worshiping person, giving them a new name, which we get a new name, remember. Our name is written in the book of life, her name is written in the book of life. She is married to the firstborn of God in the story. Yeshua is our bridegroom, and she's grafted into the faith, and Joseph's father becomes her father. Yeshua's father becomes our father. I mean, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't come up with a closer storyline, quite honestly. And so, for me, this gives such hope that, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from. You're God can redeem you. He can redeem you. Amen. Period. You're not irredeemable. And it's interesting that she's told that because her name's written in the book, she has life forever. She's not going to lose this life. She's not going to give it away. She's saved. I suspect we'll see her in heaven. In fact, I have really no doubt about it. So look for Osnath when you get there. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, now Roman numeral five. Now Joseph is a type of Messiah. All through this story now, he sent to his brothers. Yeshua was sent to Israel. How many know Yeshua didn't come directly for you? He came directly to Israel. He even says that. He says, I didn't come for you. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay. 
and he's speaking to a Gentile woman, however, she does get grafted in, okay? But his main purpose was he came to his Jewish brothers, okay? You know, you can say whatever you want to say about the Jewish people, but they are the chosen people. You might say, well, chosen for what? Well, they were chosen for a lot of things. But the word tells us they were definitely chosen to keep the oracles of God. And they did a great job with that. I mean... Uh, if you'd given the word of God to a bunch of Gentiles, we would have changed it up a thousand times by now, made it better. But he gave it to some of the most stubborn people on planet Earth. <laughs> and that stubbornness, this too, is for good. Because in their stubbornness, they refuse to bend or change the word even one iota. They just will not do it. They will not change the word. And that's to their credit and for our glory. Is it not? I mean, the only reason we even got the word is because of them. So when the church is anti-Semitic, which by and large, most of the church is anti-Semitic. You know, they're friends of Israel. They like the idea of Israel, but they don't like Jews. And if you talk with a Christian long enough, you'll see that come out more often than not. They love the idea of Israel. They just don't like Jewish people. And that is a contradiction of terms. In fact, that is anti-Semitism. And it's in the church. You know, the enemy, the, the old saying, if you can't beat them, you know, how many know the enemy can't beat the church? If you can't beat them, what do you do? You join them. The, the devil joined the church. He was one of the first members. And he did it with ill intent because he wanted to corrupt our foundation. And unfortunately, he was fairly successful. But fortunately, again, the Lord always has his remnant. Amen. So Joseph is a type of the Messiah. He's sent to his brothers. He's sent by the Father. Yeshua was sent by the Father. I mean, you know, I've said this a million times. Yeshua wouldn't have come if the Father hadn't sent him. It was the Father's love. Not Yeshua's love. It was the Father's love for you that initiated salvation. And the church has missed that altogether. Jacob sent Joseph to look for his brothers. Yeah. The father sent the son to look for the brothers. Same thing. Uh, his brothers didn't receive him. The Jews completely rejected Yeshua. I mean, except for a handful. He was a man. He was a man. He was just an itinerant rabbi. There was thousands of them running around at that time. They were either, yeah, there was, Yeshua was not an uncommon name amongst the Jews. It was a fairly common name. So there was other Yeshua rabbis running around. So they rejected him. And, you know, and that's because they've been waiting 1,500 years for the promised Messiah. This guy comes on the scene and he says, I'm him. I'm, I'm the guy you've been waiting for. I'm the Messiah. Well, how many would guess that's a hard pill to swallow? Right. You know, the churches, if, if Yeshua comes back with the paya, the curls, <laughs> wearing a kippah and a talit, holding, they'll think he's a terrorist. The church will miss him. Because they've got this Greek picture in their head. That's why you're not allowed to have an image. Because once you set an image, it gets in your mind and that's what you're looking for. And he's not this handsome guy. The word tells us he was nothing to look at. Wasn't that impressive physically? So see, when he comes, if he comes back and he's got this appearance of this Jewish rabbi, and he says, I'm the Messiah. How many rabbis are running around Israel even today claiming to be the rabbi, the savior? Many. Shearson uh, just died a few years ago, and he was quite a while now. But uh, 
I mean, by him, he had a huge following of his believers felt that he was the, the promised Messiah because they're looking for the Messiah. The Jews are looking for the Messiah as much as the church is. It's just they're looking for the first coming. We're looking for the second coming. They missed the first coming. Is it possible the church could miss the second? It's very possible. Use the, use the microphone because they got to hear you on the line. On the line there. Oh, was Frank? Let me get Frank first and then down to you. This is quick. Uh, it's thought that Messiah was also quite tall, like most of seven feet tall. Well, I don't, that's something I saw a long yeah. time ago in, in a video that somebody presented from Romania, and they said that they saw this image of a very tall man come and stand in the back of the congregation. Well, it could have been an angel. I mean, we don't know. What we do know is Yeshua was nothing to look at. He was nothing special physically. Um, there's no... Josephus wrote a description of the Messiah, but it's after the fact. And Josephus, as far as we know, never met the Messiah personally. So, and his is the only description we even have. And it's it's hard to say how accurate it really is, but there's no description of the Messiah anywhere in any writings. You would, you know, you would think that the, the, one of the disciples would have written something about him physically, but they didn't. And the reason for that is the Lord doesn't want us to, to get this picture in our head of what he looks like, because then when he comes, uh, how many times have you ever talked to somebody on the phone over and over and over again, get this picture, and then when you meet a man, they don't look anything like what you thought. You go, well, man, I, right. I thought you would look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And here you're this 90 <laughs> pound little weak little guy. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it, it you know, and the Lord doesn't want that for us. So okay, back to the the description of the like, I just know growing up, um, you know, like within the family that I thought he was missing <laughs> as a child. But later, yeah. when I was growing, as I was growing up, I saw pictures of him, and then he appeared to be, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, like you know. So my idea was like, okay, he's not Mexican; he's white. <laughs> well, Hispanic uh, tradition, yeah. in the hardcore Spanish tradition, the the, the uh, Mexicans even think he spoke Spanish. I mean, <laughs> but but the Greeks think he spoke Greek. Right. The the Americans don't know what he spoke. We're, we're pretty convinced it wasn't Hebrew, and yet it probably was, well, it was Hebrew. He spoke Hebrew, guys. Well, when we were in Bethlehem, that's what they were telling us. Yeah. He only spoke Aramaic. Yeah, that's an Arab myth. The Greeks think he spoke Greek. That's a Greek. Everyone wants to claim him for their own. There's a, there's a book, the article volume. Um, that I have, and it was supposed to be this guy that went to the Vatican and was able to get, was able to go into their library. He wasn't allowed to touch anything, but he he did write a description of of what Yeshua would look like. And again, it wasn't good looking or anything like that. Yeah. But I, I was just wondering, could there be a writing that we, you know, like this article volume? I don't know if it's real or if it's not. There, real. there could be, but the problem with the Vatican is they want everything to have a Catholic slant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to the Vatican, and there's two, two complete skeletons of Peter. <laughs> it, so, I mean, I, I know that he was double-minded at times, but, but, but to have two skulls. Uh, <laughs> you know, so you never know. This has all been lost to, to history. Um, what we, what we learned with the founding of the Dead Sea Scrolls is Hebrew was a very viable language in the day of the Lord. It was not a dead language. It was, it was very much alive. He was a Jewish carpenter living in uh, Israel, in the land of, of Canaan, Palestine. He spoke Hebrew. Now, he spoke some Aramaic, just like most of us in California speak a little bit of Spanish. Right. You know, we know a word here, a word there, and a phrase here, and a phrase there. Uh, 
even knew some great because the cultures were, you know, I mean, I can say stuff in Hebrew, English, Spanish, French, German, Italian. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. So you, you, you see, but but that but that doesn't mean I speak those languages. I know a few terms. We all do in multiple and and in the Middle East, everything is condensed, so the the the, the uh, cultures are compressed much more than here. Here, where we grew up in America, the culture is segregated just naturally. You know, you, you go where the English speakers are. You go, if you're Spanish speaking, you go where the Spanish speakers are. And it's just, remember after the Vietnam War, I mean, uh, Garden Road became Little Saigon. I mean, even the off ramp on the freeway says Little Saigon. You know, yeah. So, I mean, the, uh, culturally groups, stick together for obvious reasons. Um, and then every culture wants Yeshua to be part of their culture. So the Spanish say, well, you know, he was Mexican and he spoke Spanish. Well, no, he didn't, he didn't. And the Greeks think he was Greek and spoke Greek and, he, and that's not true either. Armenian. Armenians, the Armenians think he spoke Armenian. The, the Arabs think he spoke Aramaic. Uh, you know, and, and so it's all been lost to that. The point is, let's back, get back to our notes. Joseph is a type of the Messiah. He's, he's sent to his brothers. They don't receive him. He's rejected. He's stripped. He's killed. He's put into the earth, uh, killed symbolically. He wasn't killed literally, although they wanted to. Uh, he was put into the earth. He was virtually buried in the cistern, remember? And then he was given over to the Gentiles. Now that's very interesting because Yeshua was given to the Gentiles. When the Jews rejected him, who took up the banner? It was the Gentiles. The Gentiles took up the banner. And I mean, the Jews that know Yeshua today know him because of the Gentile believers. We know that he's the Messiah because the Jews held on to the Tanakh, the word of God which proves to us he is the Messiah. If it wasn't for the Tanakh, there was no way for you to know that Yeshua is the promised Messiah. <laughs> There's no way possible, right? So you have to understand this whole thing where God is putting us together, where we need each other. It's not just a convenient saying, we're the one new man. As Gentiles, we need the Jewish people, and the Jewish people need us. It's a marriage. It's just like in a marriage, you need that other half, right? So otherwise, you're you you feel incomplete. Vince, calculate the door here. Go ahead. No, I was um, just going to make a comment. Uh, can anybody hear me? Yeah. How are you feeling, Colette? Uh, I'm doing a lot better. Um, I I just wanted to, because of this season of of Hanukkah, and looking at Joseph being a type, you know, of a messianic mm -hmm. figure. Um, this is Genesis Bereshit, and he, the, the, all of these chapters that have been going on since chapter 20, um, chapter 37, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about this figure that Joseph is in the children of Israel. Right. And if it wasn't for him going through what he did, they wouldn't have been saved, you know? They wouldn't right. have had the wherewithal to come through that famine. And there was a famine in the land. Well, during that time of the Maccabees, there was a famine of the word of God. Like you said, there hadn't been any word from the Lord. Yeah. And it was a winter time. You know what I'm saying? It was like a time of just famine of everything, hope. And they were almost, it could have been wiped out because if there was no revolt, mm -hmm. they would have 
colonized and like just assimilated into and one all the nations that were just one of the nations under you know Greek rule or whatever. Right, right. So um, I was rereading John ten um, where Yeshua was confronted at the temple during. <laughs> And they were like, if you're the Messiah, why are you messing with us? Why don't you just like, just go ahead and come out with it and be expecting you to be. And Hanukkah would have been a time for them to say, we want somebody like, you know, Mat Matthias Maccabee or Judah Maccabee. We want somebody who come in and deal with these Romans and deal with all this oppression and like fulfill the promises that God has for this nation like he was, they were expecting him to be a certain way. This Joseph, you know, this Messiah Ben Joseph, because he's he's he refused to come out like that. He he was he he came out as that suffering servant, as that one who would take away our sins, and not as Ben David, you know, right. just, I mean, to conquer and conquer. And I think that we do, we're looking, like you said, we're looking for this figure and God is going to just be who he is. And he's going to take care of the needs that we have, you know, right. need one wipe away the sin nature because we're so evil and we're just astray. But number two, in due time, he is coming and wiping away every remnant of every kind of ungodliness and there are there are days like today where i'm just like come quickly lord you know i just i i look for that messiah that's gonna you know just come in and clean house because i just i'm just tired right so i just bless the lord that he he you know he comes in time he comes in the way that he's gonna come and it's going to be exactly what we need, but we need it. Exactly. Good. Okay, Roman numeral five. Joseph is a type of the Messiah. In letter A, both tell us to lay up treasures. Obviously, Joseph was dealing with the natural realm, so he said, you know what, bring your food in. And, uh, you know, Kathleen and I were talking the other day, too, you know, with this food, you know, sometimes I've had people come to me and say, well, you know, uh, especially in our political climate today, some people come to me and say, well, you know, the Lord is really a socialist, it's like a communist. <clears throat> Christianity is socialistic. And no, it isn't. Not at all. It's a benevolent monarchy. It's not socialistic. Here's the deal. Socialism will never work under, as long as there's sin nature, because there will always be somebody at the top of the heap. And it's interesting in the story of Joseph, because Joseph collects all the food for seven years. He doesn't give it to the people. He sells it to the people. And the word mentions that specifically. We were just talking about that. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. But he doesn't give it away. The church isn't just supposed to give everything away. We have to pay. And one of the reasons for that is because in a human being, there's always more appreciation when it costs something. David, if you want to be like David, David said, I'm never giving anything to the Lord that didn't cost me. It has to cost you. Otherwise, it means nothing. And so, it's very interesting. If you read the story closely, when he's giving this food away, we're not going to read that scripture today, but it's, it's right in there. It says he sold them as they came to the granaries. He sold the food back. It was their food in the first place. But he sells it back to them. Very important point to get because we're dealing with a, a time and a season where people are thinking socialism is the answer, and it is not the answer to anything. We just listened to a a gal that was thrown into one of the concentration camps in, in Australia. COVID camp. In a co they're calling COVID camp, which is in a little uh, cell, two meters by two meters, six feet by six feet. 
not allowed to leave the boundaries, which she did, and she got disciplined. Yeah. Uh, this is Australia. This is a free country, theoretically. And the young people are thinking this is great. Even in America, people say we need to pattern ourselves after Europe. Have you ever been to Europe? There's nothing there to pattern after. It's a disaster. But she never even tested positive after two weeks. Yeah, she was never positive. Three tests in the camp, she all negative. Like yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a phenomenal interview. Socialism is not the answer. And, and a lot, I hear a lot of Christians are rising up and saying, well, we need socialism. No. And our God is not a socialist. There's not, even in heaven, how many know in heaven there's different levels of heaven? Some people are living on New Earth, some in New Jerusalem. It's not equitable by any stretch of the imagination. We're not all equal in heaven. The Lord loves us equally. But some have more crowns to throw before his feet than others. Why? Because the Lord said, store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Remember that? That's Joseph. That, yeah. So, so Joseph says, look, I'm a, well, he didn't say this, but he was a type of the Messiah. So he says, store up your treasures here on earth. Okay, because I'm he was dealing with the natural realm. Then when the family came, they had food. Now the Yeshua is saying, store up your treasures in heaven. Because when you get there, you're going to be able to withdraw. Well, I wouldn't go that far because I'm not a real fan of social security either, but uh, you know, but I'm just saying. You can see how people get skewed in their thinking. Because if you don't really understand socialism or communism, you think, well, everyone's equal and everybody shares. That sounds very equitable. And of course, that's the word you're hearing all day long these days is equitable. It needs to be equitable. Well, you know, why are the illegals coming across the border no testing. They get flown anywhere in the United States they want to go, and they and they they want to give them a half a million dollars each. Dude, yeah. sign me. Where do I sign up? Yeah. I'm tempted to get rid of Kathleen's citizenship and make her illegal and start claiming some of these bennies. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's only for those coming over the southern border. This isn't equitable. What about people that are coming in through Canada? Yeah, you never hear one word about them. So see, this whole idea of equi equitable and, and everything's even and everything's just and everything's the same, that's not biblical. Okay, so we have to understand it. So they're both, uh, they both of them tell us to lay up treasures. struck me when you were saying before that uh, about Joseph, he also loved his family. He loved his brothers, but yet when he saw them, he didn't run up to them. He stood back and tested them. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. And he had to test them because he was afraid they were going to treat Benjamin the way they treated him. And we're told that in the story. So he's testing them to see if they've changed. Does the Lord ever test you to see if you've changed? All the time. When you get disciplined for something, you're going to go through a very similar situation again, which is a testing. Several times. Well, yeah, several times. On, but but hopefully it would be nice just to do it once. Right? Put the money in the back. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. They, he tested the brothers to, to make sure that they had really grown up and learned some lessons. And the Lord does that with us, okay? 
then indeed both were saviors to the world. Joseph on a natural level, he was a savior because he saved the, the world from a huge famine. I think it was a famine that we have no comprehension is even possible in our day. And of course, Yeshua is savior spiritually and eternally. See, both are given Gentile names. B, both are saviors. In C, both are given Gentile names. That's interesting, isn't it? This type of the savior is given a Gentile name. Remember, Zephanath Panea. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes, what his name means. But and then Yeshua was given Jesus, the Gentile name. It's not his Hebrew name. His Hebrew name is Yeshua. His mother called him Yeshua. His brothers and sisters called him Yeshua. His disciples called him Yeshua. Only the church calls him Jesus. <laughs> It, it's think about that for a moment and it's very interesting because in proverbs 31 it's a 31 or 27 31 talks about he asks the question do you know my name oh proverbs 30 do you know my name and do you know my son's name and the answer is obviously no we don't we don't even know the right name which i've often wondered I wonder how much that affects our prayer life because he says, if you ask anything in my name. Now, I realize, and I'm not going to quibble and because the Lord is gracious and he answers to the name Jesus. There's no doubt. We all, most of us in this room got saved under the name Jesus. So he obviously winks at our ignorance as the word says. But Shouldn't a believer of 30 or 40 years know that his name is not Jesus? Right. And certainly a believer, if a believer knows that, shouldn't the believer change their, their, motive, yeah. their modus operandi and start calling him Yeshua instead of Jesus? I mean, if I was calling you by the wrong name for years and then all of a sudden you straighten me out and you go, well, don't call me. That's not my name. Obviously, you don't know that, but it's not my name. And here's how you say my name. Now, if I refuse to say it, what does that say about our relationship? That, that's not good, is it? We need to be, it's one thing when we don't know, but once we know, we got to really make a habit. Let me move on, Ken, because I'm, I'm, I'm out of control here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Both were given Gentile names. By the way, the name Jesus has no known meaning. Now that is downright scary. I searched out the name Jesus for about uh, three years when I first came into the Messianic to see what it meant. There's no known meaning. So we've taken the name that's above all names and given it to the Messiah, a name that has no known meaning. And where did the word come from? Well, it came out of the Latin. Yes, from the Greek to the Latin to the English, Jesus, uh, which is similar to the Spanish, of course. Uh, but uh, there was no J sound in any alphabet in the world till the 1400s, period. No, you say the Y, kind of a Y. Hey, yeah. And you have a Spanish name? What? Your Spanish name. Don't you have a Spanish name? Me? Yeah. I don't know. What, what is my name in Spanish? Do you know? <laughs> it's Bruce. You, you call me Bruce. Why do you call me Bruce? Because that's my name. If, if a, a Spanish guy come, if a, a Spanish guy, Jose, comes in, what do you call him? Joe. You don't call him Joe. You call him Jose. Why? Because that's his name. A Juan. We've got a Juan. Why do we call him Juan and not John? Because John is the English transliteration. Right. You don't call him John because his name isn't John. It's Juan. And if you're going to show respect for somebody, do you 
arbitrarily just change their name to suit you? Or do you make an effort to, to learn how to pronounce? And you know, some foreign names are very difficult to pronounce. You know, we, we've got Stefan and, and Sylvia from Argentina, their last name, I don't even, oh I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I didn't know such a name could even exist. You know, I don't have a clue how to say it. And they've told me a bunch of times, but my tongue doesn't form that way. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I don't call them by their last name, obviously. Right? So, you know, even Adva, you know, Adva, they just moved to Colorado. That's a Hebrew name. And people call her Adva. So does she. And I said, why do you call yourself Adva? There's no A sound in the Hebrew language. It's Adva. And she goes, I know, but I just Americanized it. I, I go, well, Adva is, I think Adva is nice. Adva, I think that's nicer than Adva. Really? No one asked me, you know, no one cares. But, uh, but you see what I'm saying? We, we Americanize or we whatever, Canadianize. I tell Kathleen all the time, you're not in Canada anymore. Stop talking like that. You know, they use a lot of the ass sounds. The ass. Uh, no, we joke about a taco. See what I'm saying? Taco. No, it's not taco. The taco. Ah, ah. That, by the way, guys, this is why it's amen, not amen. There is no A in Hebrew. The A sound comes from the EI, like Hine. Amin is a perversion of the Hebrew. It's not Amen either. It's Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, it's not Amen. Now, I, I say it all the time too because we've Americanized, but Amen is a Hebrew word. It's amen. And and a lot of a lot of messianics want to sound more spiritual, so they say amen. Well, amen is a mixture of Ashkenazi with Hebrew. Mixtures in the word of God are forbidden completely. This is why we stick to not the Ashkenazi Jew uh, Hebrew, we stick to the Sephardi because it's much closer. So the, the, the Ashkenazi put the O-T or the O-S on the end of the word, like Sabbath would be Shabos. Sabbath. or it's an O-S. I mean, as soon as you put the O-S, you, you're mixing it with the talus instead of the tali. Yeah, that's right. So as soon as you do that, you're mixing the languages, and God forbids that. Why? Because in uh, the in one of the minor prophets, uh, is it Zephaniah? He talks about Hebrew being the pure holy tongue. Is it Zephaniah or what? yeah, yeah? Use the microphone. So, and then we're gonna then we're gonna finish. Press the button. No, hold it down till it's green. Um, I have a question. Could you repeat that? About, is it, it's, uh, how do you say it? Roman number one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because I, I was under a teaching once and they said that they spent, okay, I'm, I don't, I don't want to say it's wrong, but is it O-M-A-N-E? O-M-A-N-E? No, it's not O-M-A-N-E. Okay, how, do, how is it? Amen. Amen. So, it's pure and simple. It's very simple. Amen, Amen. Is, is the word. Okay. Uh, the Amen is the mixture of, the Ashkenazi Hebrew is a mixture of Yiddish and German and Hebrew. And so you take those three languages and you put them together. Main is a very common German type sound. So it's a mixture of that. So the Amen is the pure Hebrew. My, one of my Hebrew uh, mentors uh, corrected me on that years ago, boy. I'll never forget it. <laughs> no, Amnon. 
he gave a great teaching on the amen and when you and when you spell it out it, it's amen it's not amen okay all right so um they're both given a bride in letter d okay a bride then in roman numeral six Remember, I talked about his name is changed in forty in Genesis forty one forty five in the in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. Uh, he's given the it, he actually records it as his uh, his name is Zafnat Zafnat Pa Neka. Thank you. Very good. You've been practicing that one. Okay. And that literally means he who explains whatever is hidden. He who explains whatever is hidden. Now, if we go over to John chapter 1, this is very important scripture here. John chapter 1, verse 18. From the New American Standard, it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. The word there is exegete. This is where we get the term or the, or the word for exegetical teaching, which is line upon line. That's what we're doing here. Basically, we're going through word. We're breaking down words, what they mean. We're explaining as we go. It's exegetical in nature. Uh, and so this is what the Lord did. When the Lord came, he explained the Father. That's what he did. He didn't come to garnish glory unto himself. He even told us in John 17, he said, don't pray to me. Pray to the Father, but pray in my name. The church has gotten that one wrong. Big time. Pray to the Father, guys. It's the Father that wants the relationship with you. And I'm not saying Yeshua doesn't, but it all started with the Father. The, the reason the Lord even came was to reconcile us to the Father. The Word tells us that. And in Christianity, by and large, the Father gets pushed into the closet because we just don't know what to do with him. You know, we, we know that he's, he's important, but so many people think or have this picture of the Father as this mean old grumpy guy that's waiting to slap you around when you do something wrong and that's just not who the father is so he the father wants to to enter into a relationship with us that's why he sent his son no one comes to the father except through me he didn't say you can't come to me except through me he said no one comes to the father my whole job is to bring you to the father for me, when I came into the Messianic movement, that was probably one of the greatest of all the revelations that I, I got. Amen. Because before that, it was all about Jesus. Jesus is everything. I mean, he, he's the reason for everything. And, and I'm not saying that, that that's not true to a degree, but, but it's taken much too far in the church. And so the church, it's all about Jesus, but the Father and the Holy Spirit just get second billing at best if, we're, if we feel generous. So the Lord has come and explained him. Then in Roman numeral seven, out of this union comes two members of the tribes. Ephraim and Manasseh are grafted in. And they become uh, landholders. Now, there's, there's uh, a few different listings of the tribes of, of Israel. I think there's four different listings, and they're different. Um, and the reason they're different is because they focus on different things. But Ephraim and Manasseh both have land grants in the land. Yes, they, do. they both hold portions of the land. And some people think that we'll be grafted in through uh, Ephraim and then we'll live in their portion. And there's great arguments for that. Others, I typically think we're going to be grafted in through Judah and live in the land of Judah. Uh, 
and there's great arguments for that. I know both arguments and they they're both have sound points. All we know for sure is we're grafted in and we're gonna have an inheritance. And you know what? It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be awesome. We'll be there. This too is for good, right? We don't have to be in, in the preferred. Uh, it's very interesting, however, that, that in the land of Ephraim, Ephraim is right just north of Jerusalem. And the mountains overlook Jerusalem. And it's interesting because in Hebrew, the word for Christian is the word notzerim. Notzerim. And notzerim means watchman. So here these watchmen overlook Jerusalem. This is one of the arguments for being grafted in through Ephraim. And that's why a lot of people in the Messianic movement, uh, one house people, uh, or actually two house people, excuse me, two house people say that we're Ephraim. Uh, I don't personally believe that. I believe there's an actual tribe of Ephraim that are Jewish. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a two house person. But it's not worth uh, dividing over. No, three, not Sarah's. Sarah's. Yeah, yeah. No, three, not yeah, Sarah's. yeah. Right. Well, it's a different. It's a different yeah. word altogether. So you should know that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a yeah. No, Sareem doesn't come from Nazareth. Yeah, and, and okay, it's a whole different word. So, uh, but anyway, so in letter A, Manasseh means forgetful, which is very interesting because we have forgotten the Jewish people. Now, of course, Joseph names him uh, forgetful because he for, it helped him to forget his woes. And then Ephraim means a double fruitful, doubly fruitful. Why do we pray? Children of the yeah, that's what I was wondering. Because that is how uh, uh, was it Jacob or 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 Isaac prayed that way. It was it was Jacob when uh, he gave the blessing for the kids. He said, "This is how you're going to pray," and he included Manasseh and Ephraim in the prayer. So, in other words, he was making sure they were part of the tribe. Says, I will be like them. Yeah, yeah, because they were gen they were basically Gentiles grafted in. You know, the, the mitochondria, the DNA comes from predominantly from the woman, from the woman's genes. So in this case, Joseph. Give me a favor, let me back in for some reason. Oh, I you. I got kicked out. We didn't lose everybody. Okay. No, I don't think so. Okay, good. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Um, the what? The mitochondria. Oh, yeah. The, the, the mitochondria comes mostly from the woman in the DNA. So what that means is uh, in when we're talking about uh genetically you're jewish if your mother was jewish if your father is gentile and your mother is jewish then you're jewish according to the definition because you receive those jewish genes now that's on the biological level on the spiritual level the genealogies always go through the men because the men are the heads of families they're the spiritual leaders right, right? so in this case, we're talking about biology. So Manasseh and Ephraim, their mother is a Gentile. Because I don't believe this, this is Dinah. You know, no. Yeah, I don't believe this is the daughter. Uh, so. Uh, Many Jews won't marry a legitimate convert. No, I know. I know. The Orthodox uh, don't see it that way. It's a terrible sin. It's a sin. Yeah, because in, in the Torah, you were never forbidden from marrying a Gentile. You can marry a Gentile. The Lord just didn't, he didn't want you marrying a pagan. 
which is very interesting in the story we read this morning because she converted before the marriage. She gave up all her idolatry before the marriage. So technically she was no longer a pagan. She was still a Gentile. If you believe in Jesus, that's considered pagan. Oh yeah, with the with the Orthodox Jews. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we don't know that. Uh, there and there's some, um, and I'm sure you've read that. Uh, many think that Manasseh is actually the interpreter for Joseph when his brothers come. So yeah, that's what I was going to share. Yeah, that Manasseh and Ephraim, they both spoke according to the rabbis. They both spoke Hebrew, and they were the ones that translated when the family came down into Egypt. Yeah. How was it? Well, I've never done the math. I'm not sure, but. Um, but he would, but he could still interpret at, at that age. Sure, he could, because he would. His daily language would be Egyptian, obviously. I mean, they didn't speak Hebrew at the marketplace. They they were living in Egypt, right? He taught them Hebrew, and so many scholars think that his sons were actually his interpreters when his brothers came, because it says he spoke through an interpreter. We're told that, even though he spoke Hebrew, because after he reveals himself, he speaks in Hebrew. But he didn't want to give that away because. Everything Hebrew for an Egyptian is an abomination. So if he was interpreter, he's 30 years old when he collects the grain. They come two years into so you need the microphone. <laughs> that would make the, the children at least seven or eight years old. But even they can interpret. I mean, I don't. Agba's daughter interpreted many things for me through the years. Who? Agba's daughter, Rivka, yeah. Rebecca. I've been in the market where I've seen little six-year-olds, yeah, uh, speaking for their parents, uh, translating in English. Yeah. So yeah, you see that in the in the Hispanic yeah, I, I all the time. The, uh, uh, one born in the United States interpreting to the grandmother that came from another country. And yeah, but I don't see this with a in the court of the pharaoh, a seven year old uh, interpreting. Well, he would have taught them at home. My Jewish source doesn't go that way. <laughs> well, your Jewish source is probably wrong in this case. <laughs> No. <laughs> and guys, that's our message for today. That's our study for today. Six A was oh, Yeshua explains the Father. I'm sorry. I really need the answers. I have them all right here. And then in seven A is forgetful, and B is double fruitful.